So now our reading this evening is from 1 John chapter 2, starting at verse 7 through to verse 17, where the Apostle writes, Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you've had since the beginning. This old command is the message you've heard. Yet I'm writing to you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they're going because the darkness has blinded them. I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. We're looking at this first letter of John, written to Christians who were falling away from God. Very early in his first letter, John has written, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. The heart of following Jesus is this new personal relationship which Christians have with God, our Heavenly Father and with the Son Jesus Christ and with other believers as well. And John's writing to Christians who are breaking that fellowship with God and with the church in a number of ways. We saw last week, some people were denying that they were sinful or that they'd sinned. So John calls them to confess their sins, assuring them of the promise that God will forgive them through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. Then in chapter two, we read that John encourages his readers to keep on obeying God's commands to walk in the light of God, as God himself is in the light. We know that we've come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says I know him but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anybody obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. Obedience is essential if we wish to remain in fellowship with God and with each other. And the standard of obedience God demands is very high. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. So there in chapter two, while John talks in general about obeying God's commands, it's very clear from our passage we've just read that there's one particular command he has in mind. So he goes on to say this in verse seven, dear friends, I'm not writing to you a new command, but an old one, which you've had since the beginning. This old command is the message you've heard. Yet I am writing to you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. We're called as Christians to walk in the true light of God. And John's readers already knew what they should be doing. They'd heard it right from the start of their discipleship. But it's a new command because it always has a freshness to it just as God's love and mercy to us is fresh and new every morning. Anyone who claims to be in the light 
but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. This new command, which is old, which was there from the beginning, of course, is what Jesus called the new commandment, which he gave to his disciples, to love one another. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. There is the new command, love, at the heart of the gospel. Our love for other Christians is the essence of our witness to the world. And Jesus has set us the example and the standard for that love. Just as I have loved you, so you must love one another, says Jesus. Love is the sign that we're living in the light. Its opposite would be hating our fellow Christians. And that would be clear evidence that a person is still living in darkness. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they're going because the darkness has blinded them. Son of John's readers were bringing division to the church, demonstrating hatred for other Christians. So John wants to remind them of the supreme importance of love. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. That's the challenge for every believer in every church in every age. Relationships between Christians in the church are our witness to the world. There's no place for hatred or division. John's going to talk about this again a lot through this letter. So we won't say any more about it tonight. We're coming back to the theme in weeks to come, the importance of loving one another. So then he goes on to a, a couple of verses, which are a bit strange for a number of reasons. I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you've overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you overcome the evil one. Quite strange, really. To begin with, it's not obvious what place this section has in the argument John's making in his letter. Why would he start talking to his readers at this point about his reasons for writing? Then the grammar's a bit strange as well, uh, but strange in a way which the NIV hides. Verse 13 is in the present tense. I am writing to you. Verse 14 is actually in the past tense. I wrote to you. NIV translates this in the present I write. Because in Greek letters, they sometimes said, I wrote when they were referring to the current letter rather than some previous correspondence. Um, the Greek uh, phrase for this is the epistolatory aorist, the past tense used in a letter to mean what I'm writing to you now. Um, commentators generally agree that there's no significance whatsoever in John saying I am writing and then repeating the same three things uh, by saying I write or I wrote. Um, they also agree there's no real significance in the, the small changes in the repetition uh, other than for emphasis. And commentators are also mostly agreed that when John talks about children and fathers and young men, he's probably talking about Christian experience rather than age in years. So he's talking to young Christians and then to mature Christians, the fathers and to Christians with a vibrant faith, young men. Everybody also agrees that the characteristics which John assigns to particular Christians should be, should, should be very much true of all Christians at every stage in their discipleship. So when he says your sins have been forgiven on account of his name, and when he says because you know the Father, those things are not just true of young Christians, but of all Christians because you know him who is from the beginning. It's not just true of mature Christians, but of all Christians. 
You are strong and the word of God lives in you. You have overcome the evil one. Surely refers to all Christians and not just young men and young women, of course. All Christians have experienced forgiveness. All Christians know the Father. Through Christ, we've all overcome the evil one. So here in this rather strange couple of verses, John's simply reminding his Christian readers of what their discipleship should be about. It's a challenge to obey God's commands, especially to obey the new commandment to love one another. But it's also then preparing the way for the next challenge, which comes as a rebuke to some of John's readers in the ways they are departing from the true faith. Because he wants them to go on and say, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. This is why some of the readers of this letter were falling away because they loved the world too much. They loved the world more than they loved God. Great reformer John Calvin said something like this. I can't remember the exact quote. But something like this, unless a person breaks free from the pull of the things of this world, they will forever be bound to it. Love of the things of this fallen world, the sin of the rich young ruler who wouldn't let go of his wealth and possessions in order to follow Jesus. For everything in the world, says John, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life comes not from the father, but from the world. The lust of the flesh, passion for sensual satisfaction. The lust of the eyes means an inordinate desire for the finer things of life, but also probably includes elements of sexual desire. The pride of life means self-satisfaction in who we are and the things we have and what we've accomplished. These are three things which lead people into sin. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. There's an interesting echo here in what we read about the very first sin, when Adam and Eve rebelled against God in the Garden of Eden. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. You saw the fruit, she desired the fruit, she took the fruit and she gave some of the fruit to Adam. What we see leads us on to wanting it, on to taking what we should not have and then passing that on, causing others to do the same. Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. What a, a perfect summary of our own self-centred, self-obsessed generation. Message puts it this way, don't love the world's ways, don't love the world's goods, love of the world squeezes out love for the Father. Practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, have nothing to do with the Father. They just isolate you from him. The world and all its wanting, wanting, wanting is on the way out. Whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. Worldliness was causing some of John's readers to break fellowship with God and, and with each other. Uh, it's the warning which comes down the generations to us today, not to love the things of this world. So John warns them the world and this desires pass away whoever does the will of god lives forever a reminder of the words of jesus to have treasures in heaven not treasures on earth for where your treasures are there your heart will be also love one another don't hate other people do not love the world which is passing away because whoever does the will of God lives forever. This is what it means to walk in the light.
Let's reflect on those words for a moment. <laughs> 